Kowalski. We are glad to have you here. Uh, Kim is a research associate professor at the University of Chicago Harris School of Public Policy and a scholar with the Energy Policy Institute at the University of Chicago. Her work draws on the fields of environmental, social, and positive psychology to examine the behavioral dimensions of energy issues with the aim of improving the design of public-facing policies and programs. You might now know why we invited her to be here with us today. A central focus of her work is understanding the motivations and barriers associated with consumer adoption of efficient and renewable energy technologies. And she's going to give a presentation entitled From Awareness to Action, Behavioral Insights for Increasing Consumer Uptake of Low Carbon Technologies. Please welcome you. Like going 
to the grocery store where none of the items are individually priced, and all you get is a total. And so now you're making guesses like, well, does this work too? Because this box was big. Or are these things more expensive uh, because they seem more premiums? <laughs> the consequence of people not understanding their consumption is that they tend to overestimate the benefits of really small actions. There have been numerous studies over three decades showing that if you ask people what's the most effective thing you can do to save energy, one of the top mentioned things will be turn off the lights. Those environmental campaigns from the 80s and 90s really did a good job. <laughs> That's not the case now. If you ask them about what can you do to help address climate change, What also happens, though, is they underestimate the impact of the things that do use a lot of energy. So this complicated-looking graph is now sort of a famous study from Shafina Tari at Indiana University. She and colleagues have asked people to estimate the kilowatt hour consumption of different household devices. And they would like that, you know, a traditional incandescent light bulb uses 100 watts. If people got this correctly, see all the dots going on that 45 degree angle. But instead you see this compression, where everything is just a little bit more or less than that angle. Just, just to give you an example of what this graph is showing, people think that an electric clothes dryer only uses three times as much energy as a laptop. The actual difference is about a hundred times. So, if people are this confused about their energy consumption, it's not hard to understand why they don't necessarily see urgency around things like weatherization or getting a heat pump or an electric vehicle. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, we try to have campaign messages that emphasize the benefits you can save energy, you save money, you do weatherization, you might be talking about increasing comfort. And while it for sure is good to point out the benefits of these actions, let me help you understand why this may still not be motivated enough. So, instead of being these perfectly rational creatures, humans use a lot of mental shortcuts to make decisions. We call these cognitive biases, and one of them is what we call the sunk cost fallacy. I'm sure I've got an old car here. I like to use the example of a refrigerator. My own grandparents kept a refrigerator that was older than me. 25 years because they're from the waste not want not generation. I paid for this, it works. Why wouldn't I use this until it dies? They were blown away when they had to get a new refrigerator. But some of those keeps people invested in what they already have. What I think is particularly relevant to these new technologies like heat pumps are two biases called present bias and loss aversion. Present bias is this idea that we like instant gratification. We care more about immediate rewards than future gains. That's why we get tempted into the piece of chocolate cake, even though we have a long term goal of being healthy. Loss aversion is this idea that we feel the pain of a loss much more than we feel the joy of an equivalent gain. So, in other words, it's a great thing if you happen to find a bill on the sidewalk because I'm going to drop that's nice. It feels so much worse if you're the person that lost it. It feels, many studies show that loss can feel twice as big as the joy of And when you put these things together, you end up in a situation where, as pictures of heat pump water heaters, if you're judging between the heat pump water heater, it's almost $2,000, and an electric traditional one that's 500, you care more about saving the money now than $1,500 saved because the savings promise of that heat pump water heater seems very uncertain. So what's happening in people's minds is those very certain upfront losses are weighing more in their decision making, even if that new technology will more than pay back for itself in the long term. Now, some of you work on programs, I imagine, that are fully subsidized, where people are not worrying about upfront costs. And what's important.
important to understand is there are other types of losses. The time you have to spend researching to understand the technology. Who am I going to find you to? Like, I want to get an electric vehicle. Who's selling them? Which brands? Uh, where do I find an electrician to install a charger? There's the inconvenience of having to schedule a contractor work. And then for some of these technologies, we're talking about changes in routine, and that also feels like a loss. So, actually, just a little side note, for those of you who maybe on the utility side thinking about how to get people to shift their energy consumption, maybe for when they're charging their electric vehicles, these types of losses still apply. I have a colleague at the partner at the Sea Change Institute, there's a, they have found there's a whole segment of EV doctors who just can't find the time to research on how to time of use to price. So those losses are ran heavily and causing them to miss out on an opportunity. So we end up in this situation where all of these mental losses are greatly outweighing the uncertain future benefits of investing. And one of the things we know when we're trying to get people to adopt an innovation is that people have to see a relative advantage to what they were doing before. And if you're talking about, say, someone's current heating system, this is flipped, right? These are now all the benefits. I don't have to do research. I can just keep using the heating system that I have. And sure, maybe I'm spending a little bit more, but gosh, I can see it in terms of not all of this has to So what are some things we can do to try to shift the balance? of these costs and benefits. And I'm going to share with you some evidence-based strategies. One of these is about simplifying the process to adoption and making it social. And I'll explain both of these. So as an environmental psychologist, I think a lot about what I call the information environment. Um, environmental psychologists study how people are influenced by things that are happening in the environment. And this goes back to our previous group ancestors. We like to be in environments where we can easily wayfind and have a sense of where we're going. And unfortunately, a lot of the energy space is through a lot of information that people that's a lot. So one of the things we can do is really shift the burden to the implementers and program administrators and not to the end users. And some of this is going to feel, some of this I know Vermont is already today, and some of this might feel proper too. But, um, certainly, having a network of approved contractors so people already know who's a trusted entity is a great start. There's kind of, we often, especially in the US, think that you know, choice is better. It's for people lots of options so they can get exactly what they want. And what we know from psychology is that the more the more options there are, the more people are likely to do nothing and to stick with their status quo. So think about how do we reduce this set of options to a short menu of maybe two or three different things. Likewise, we need to resist providing all of the information. I, I don't know if it's the lawyers that we should be looking for this, but I see all the different writers sometimes on how do you qualify for a program, we tend to put everything out there all at once. And less is more. And to give you an example of an information environment where people are not restraining themselves, let me remind you of something you might find in your home. Those terrible remote controls with about 100 buttons and you can get about three of them. This is the actually the remote from my DVD player. It has things on it that have yeah, what they need. And the engineers who designed it so desperately wanted to know the cool things they have programmed into the DVD player. And I would say, as energy professionals, we are used to being like these engineers. We know all the different steps, there's all these different nuances in terms of who can qualify. We're kind of expecting people to figure out how to navigate this when all they want to do is. So we need to do more of this is my screen, my road code for her. He understands. I just want to watch, binge watch something. And now we're going to add a 
two more than one. Well, it's like this. You don't want to show that just a small minority of people adopted. You want to show that as the cool trend. <laughs> so you want to avoid making them seem like a minority and instead celebrate, hey, you've seen a 50% increase in EV adoption. I think all these statistics um, don't do that. Um, <laughs> you can also use your survey research. You can show that people are supportive of actions or that they are satisfied with the technologies. And as long as you are showing a majority, it helps convey this is the norm, and it signals other people that I respect and care about think that this is important, so maybe I should consider this. So I made the point earlier, target people at the right time. And there's one way we can kind of create that feeling without some of these lines for people. Um, when it comes to just adopting 
adopting these technologies, I think there's a lot you can do that doesn't make people feel like they're only operating in losses. If you streamline the process so much and help them see how some technology is going to help them achieve their goals, um, I, it's a little bit easier. Um, when you're talking about climate anxiety, one of the challenges with how people respond to climate change is they can feel like their actions are a drop in the bucket. Genuinely, you as an individual or behavior is not going to change the climate. But this is, you can take the lesson I had of showing positive change, help the people see and matter to the change that is happening in their community. That can actually be inspiring as well. It's part of what we call collective advocacy, do I feel that collectively our society can make a difference. And I don't think we do a good enough job emphasizing the good stuff that's happening, because it's always about the negative stuff. So you can think about that in your own outreach as well. Thank you. Um, have you tested carbon taxes versus incentives for motivating carbon reductions? Or perhaps, do you know people who have? Um, carbon taxes are not popular. Uh, I work with a lot of energy economists, and the short story is it's not exactly a feasible strategy. Um, there have been a lot of studies looking at how people think about carbon taxes and under what conditions they would find them more favorable. Uh, they want to see that the tax is being used for environmental goods or that it's being redistributed to people. Uh, but I think a lot of people in this community think it's a no go. I'm going to ask one more question. Do you, well, actually, I'm going to ask two more questions. The, the last one is softball. Um, do you know of ways or tools that have proven effective in helping people understand the relative impact of each investment on their electric bill? Yeah. Um, so, not something quite as specific as that, but Shizu Atari, who did the research showing people don't see a lot of variation in consumption, has also done work showing that it's helpful to give them rules of thumb. So large appliances, appliances that use heating or cooling, that have motors, giving people sort of the non-technical rule of thumb of this probably uses more energy um, can help them understand a little bit more. I think in general you definitely want to stay away from just education spending the time, anything that's quick and easy for them to process is going to be more valuable. Great. My uh, final very easy question is, is it okay if you share your slides? Okay. <laughs> Excellent. So I'm hoping to share all or most of the slides from today after the, all of the presentations are done. Kim, thank you so much for joining us. She's going to be with us. Okay.